70s, was palm to palm hand clasping in, in, in the um, accurate sense of, of, of a descriptive sense of the word. But we now find that uh, a neighboring community in the same population, but their neighbors, do a version where one may rest the hand on the other, or sometimes they go through a sort of token form of hand clasping where they just sort of touch wrists. But when they do rest the hand, uh, when one rests on the other, we found in all cases the one that bears the weight is the subordinate. And the one that's dominant in terms of social rank is the one on top. So that not only signals who we are, that is, we're members of M group as opposed to K group, but it also signals to others, uh, if they need to know, uh, what our relative social ranks are. The analogy is that if you happen to switch on the telly and you find a Second World War film and it's a military film and some sergeant is uh, saluting a lieutenant, if the salute goes like this with palm forward, then you, you know you're in a British war film. But if the salute goes like this with palm down, you know you're in an American war film. And the only difference between the two gestures is just orientation of the palm. But it functions quite satisfactorily, if you wish, as, as an identifier. So now what we're able to do, and we've really only been able to do it in the last few years, is put all that together. And I think we're living at a very exciting time, a really unique time in getting to know, you know our closest living relative at last. To be able to do what anthropologists, of course, have been able to do for a long time, to go to different cultures across Africa and compare them. Now we can kind of take this bird's eye view for chimpanzees at last and look right across Africa at these different communities. What this research shows that a chimpanzee from any one community has a unique profile of cultural behaviours. So it's a, it's a bit like the human case where you could find one individual, study its behaviour, you might find that this individual uses a knife and fork compared to another one uses chopsticks and so you know they're over from the west somewhere but then you find well they also wear this funny skirt uh, it's called a kilt and uh, they eat porridge and so you probably say well they're probably from Scotland in, in fact you know you can be even more specific about it well in the case of chimpanzees over in West Africa we'll find um, well we've, we're looking at a chimpanzee it's cracking nuts with a stone tool so we know yes that is a West African chimpanzee, but oh as well, we've watched it more and it will go into the top of a palm tree and pluck a piece of the palm frond and then use that to mash into the top of the palm tree. Then we know in fact it's at Bosu um, and not at the Thai forest where the chimpanzees have those palm trees but they don't do that. So the specificity of, of what we now know about these behaviours does mean yes, show me a chimpanzee, tell me which behavioural profile and I'll tell you which community it lives in, what its culture is in that sense. So chimps have the beginnings of culture, a landmark discovery. The gulf between us is receding fast. But let's be honest, we've yet to hear a chimp symphony or watch an ape opera. Surely chimps are still far from scaling the lofty battlements of culture as we know it. They can't even talk. Or can they? I think almost any domain that you take uh, that we consider unique, like culture or language or morality, um, you can very well make the argument that we are unique in, in these regards. But if you break down the, it in, in smaller components, you will find some of these components in other animals. So even language, where people think that you can draw the clearest line, you can break language apart in its components, like using of symbolic communication. Apes can do that. Uh, classifying and organizing objects. Apes can do that. And so you can, each time you break the human capacity apart, you're going to find connections with other animals. In captivity, we have been able to teach chimps and gorillas like Coco to communicate with us using simple signs and symbols. Okay, I'll find some. I'll get one. Okay? Okay, okay, okay. I'm getting it. There it is. You, okay, you want to listen? Okay, you listen some more. The gap between this and our own prodigious powers of communication seems huge. 
But why would an ape want to communicate with us anyway? The better question is, can apes communicate with each other in ways we don't yet understand? Chimps are certainly vocal, emitting a range of distinguishable barks, grunts and screams, along with the more sophisticated two-part pant hoot. Though exactly what they're saying is, so far, not clear. I'm sure that they have representational communication so that their, that their calls refer to, for instance, food, something in the external environment. But I think it's also very likely that they do have syntax and that the order with which calls come out are, are significant in terms, of, in terms of the information they convey. We have still a prejudice. It should be uh, emotion elicited um, uncontrolled vocal sounds. Definitely it's not. They control the sounds. And in the case of uh, adult male chimpanzees, the story is somehow more complex because they used to use drumming. By kicking the buttress of the huge tree, they made the drumming noise with pant foot. And pant foot consists of the two phase of building hood and climax and drumming may be in the middle of hooting and wa or drumming may be the suffix in the end of pat foot so there is a order of the components and there might be a possibility of such a component have the sequential meaning because A approach B is different from B approach A. So the component is the same, but if the order were different, now the meaning is different. That is our way of language communication. It's really, really early days, but I'm hoping that more work will be done because I think, I mean, and those are just the loud vocalizations. They've got a whole range of much softer grunts that they use in more kind of intimate circumstances, which, for, I mean, we can't even really discriminate between their, their differences are so subtle. Ooh. Perhaps we're looking too hard for technical skills, like language and art, that we perform so well, but that may simply have little relevance to a chimp. Years ago, we found that chimps like Congo, given paints, paintbrush and A3 paper, could create dramatic images, though what use this might be to a chimp in the wild was never really established. And Congo's paintings do display a sort of raw expressiveness even if they're hardly destined for the Tate Modern. But primatologists have now realized that for wild chimps, and possibly for us too, there are more important skills that may have been honed during our social and cultural evolution. It would seem that politics and diplomacy, winning friends and influencing others, may run deep in our primate veins. Instead of looking at morality as a new invention, I look at it as a natural outgrowth of ancient social tendencies. What is transmitted? Knowledge and technique only? No, maybe values, or institution, or uh, morality. So if you make it complex, the culture found in chimpanzees getting closer and closer to the culture of ours. This is radical. Could it be that apes show an embryonic awareness of right and wrong, good and bad, of collaborative versus selfish? It's a growing new field of study they call Machiavelli.